It's finally here, you guys! Game of Thrones premiered back in the spring of 2011, and now, after 8 years, 23 if you're a fan of the books, we are finally getting the answer we've all been waiting for. Who will win Clegane Bowl? It's a battle of the titans. In one corner, we've got a man who can crush your head like a gusher. And in the other, we've got a man who really likes his chickens. It's the meme the writers have reluctantly included for fan service, but nevertheless, get hype. Oh, and uh, I guess we'll also get to find out who gets to rule Westeros. So that's cool. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show where the night is dark and full of theories. You guys, I can't believe that Game of Thrones is nearly over. I know, I know that we're gonna get ourselves a variety of spin-offs and whatnot, but we can never go back to this time when we were first discovering a fantasy series that was as rich as Lord of the Rings, with the added bonus anxiety of thinking that any character could die at any time. And at this point, with only six episodes left, it's impressive that Game of Thrones still feels like it could go in any dozen of different directions. Will Jon and Danny save the world and become Westeros' hot young power couple? Will Bran turn out to be the Night King? Or will Podrick heal the world with his magical lovemaking? These ladies enjoyed him so much, they gave him the time for free. No one knows. Well, no one except for Sansa's friends. It is probably the single most hyped series finale in TV history since Breaking Bad ended back in 2013. So much so that there are betting odds for who will rule Westeros at the end, as well as who will be first to die in this new season. Let's just say, looking at the odds, things aren't looking too hot for the Greyjoys. And so of course, true to form, today's theory is all about how this whole thing is gonna end. Now, is my theory today gonna tell you to run to Vegas, plunk down your cash on tier and varies and Danny for the win play show to get yourself rich? No. Today's theory is about how Game of Thrones should end, not about how it will end. And I think that those are two very different things. At this point, the narrative of Game of Thrones is constrained by a number of factors. It's a victim of its own success. I mean, sure, Game of Thrones isn't afraid of being dark and ripping fans' hearts out, but HBO might now be reluctant to do certain things now that they want people to stay invested in Game of Thrones spin-off shows. They might feel like they need a more TV-friendly ending that leaves people wanting more, or leaves certain characters alive. Plus, who knows how much the end of the series will line up with the way that George R.R. R. Martin decides to end the books. I mean, if you're Martin, don't you kinda want the show to end a bit differently so that there's still some reason to read those last two books, Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring, when they eventually come out? If they eventually come out? They're never coming out, are they? So today, I'm talking about the ending that should happen. Once you get past all the dragons and war and incest, what is Game of Thrones really about? And what kind of ending would serve all those themes the best? It may not be the ending that Westeros needs, but it is the ending that Westeros deserves. As Kate says in her prophecy for Daenerys, to go forward, you must go back. So to think about how Game of Thrones should end, let's take a look at how it begins. The pilot of a show like Game of Thrones is important because it's likely to establish not just the characters and setting and plot points that'll endure throughout the show, but also because they tend to hint at the themes and messages that the show will explore throughout the rest of its run. In our inaugural episode, we establish three main houses, Stark, Lannister, and Targaryen. These are the ones that the show tells us to invest in at the outset. And while plenty of other houses have become important over the course of the series, the show, going into its final season, is still focused on these three. The Tyrells are dead. The Boltons are dead. The Martells are dead. The daughter will die here in this cell. You will be here watching. The Freys are dead. Winter came for House Frey. The Greyjoys and Tullys are still kicking around, but with me, do you really care? No. Every time I hear about the Greyjoys, my eyes roll into the back of my head. What is dead may never die. What is dead may never die? More like what is dead should stay dead and just stick on their own damn island. They're distractions. They were never real contenders for the throne. But not only are the Starks, Lannisters, and Targaryens the first three houses we've become familiar with, each one demonstrates a major theme that ends up pervading the rest of the series. One, the price of power 
power, two, the failure of man's institutions, and three, the dangers of pride. And by looking at the way the series explores these themes and these houses, we get ourselves a clear pathway to what should be the ending for the entire series. Theme number one, the price of power. From the earliest days of watching this series, we may not have been able to tell a Maester Pycel from a Barristan Selmy, but one thing we all knew was the Lannister motto. A Lannister always Don't pays. say it. Don't say it. It was beaten over our head. With a seemingly limitless amount of money, they bought their way into power and prestige in Westeros. They understand the cost of things. And they understood that sometimes that cost is more than just a bag of gold. More often than not, the price of their own lofty ambitions was human life. In the pilot alone, they poisoned the hand of the King John Aaron to prevent him from revealing the fact that Robert's children were in fact Jamie's, and then they attempt to murder Bran for discovering the same exact thing. Whether they're pushing children from windows, hijacking their enemies' weddings, or blowing up hundreds of people to avoid going to trial, there is nothing that the Lannisters won't do to remain in charge. And while the juicy violence is certainly a part of the reason why we watch the show, a huge part of the narrative is all about the debts that need to be paid when you take these sorts of actions. The karma that results from this kind of lust for power. Tywin Lannister masterminds the Red Wedding, which kills Catelyn Stark, only to have Peter Baelish reciprocate by killing his grandson during the Purple Wedding. Cersei may solve one problem in blowing up the Sept of Baelor at the end of Season 6, but the karmic retribution she receives is that her last living child, Tommen, jumps to his death out of grief. She achieves power, but at the cost of the only thing that truly mattered to her in her life, her children dying off. The Lannisters do indeed pay their debts. And while it's most obvious with the Lannisters, the the price of power is something that pervades every element of this series. Stannis is so consumed by his desire to be king that he's willing to murder his brother Renly and burn his daughter Shireen. He still loses and dies. Daenerys' older brother Viserys arranges to have his sister married off to a bloodthirsty warlord just so he can retake the crown. And in the end, Viserys gets his crown, just not the way he intended. Even the more honorable quests for power come with a huge price tag. Few would argue that Jon Snow didn't hold the moral high ground against Ramsay Bolton during the Battle of the Bastards, but the show makes sure that we see that even justified conquest is awful. Jon Snow doesn't want thousands of people to die, offering Ramsay a one-on-one -on -one duel instead, but when Ramsay refuses, everyone on that battlefield ends up dying anyway. So much so that Jon almost suffocates to death under a giant pile of corpses. And then he got Daenerys, who genuinely has progressive ideas about abolishing slavery and demolishing class divisions. But for someone who talks about leaving the world a better place than she found it, she sure does love burning people alive. The moral here is that everyone, good, bad, or otherwise, has blood on their hands. And sure, while you may be rewarded temporarily, eventually you're gonna have to pay your karmic debt. Theme number two, the failure of institutions. The thirst for power is a big element to Game of Thrones to be sure, but in reality, it's just a symptom of institutions that humans have put into place for themselves. Part of the reason Daenerys wants to break the wheel in the first place is because the rules about how people are governed are unjust and lead to abuse. The system of royal succession, for example, not only leads to infighting, but also gives rise to rulers who have no business ruling. Joffrey? He cared more about torturing people with crossbows than he did about ruling. Tommen? He was around 13 when he took the throne. Heck, even King Baratheon. I mean, sure, he was older and not a homicidal sociopath, but he readily admits that he was a warrior rather than a ruler. Lord Eddard Stark, I would name you the Hand of the King. I'm not trying to honor you. I'm trying to get you to run my kingdom while I eat, drink, and haul my way to an early grave. The fight between Stannis and Renly? Sure, Stannis had a better claim to the throne as the next oldest brother to the king, but Renly was probably the better option, having more public support and leadership ability. The systems devised by men are constantly failing. The characters know that they're flawed, but they don't do anything to fundamentally change the system. Even Daenerys herself is a part of this problem. I mean, think about it. She says that she wants to change 
change everything. But at the same time, she insists that she's the rightful claim to the throne simply because she's the daughter of a former king. A former king who happened to be a homicidal maniac. She says she wants to break the wheel, but apparently she doesn't want to break the wheel entirely. She wants to keep intact the parts of the wheel that, you know, support her claim to the throne. I mean, nobody is really advocating for democracy in Westeros, so how much are we really shattering that wheel, friends? And it's not just political systems either. Look at another institution that plays a huge role throughout the story, marriage. Daenerys, at least in the books, is a 13-year-old who's married off to a warlord. Sansa's marriage to Tyrion is loveless and fails to protect her. Her marriage to Ramsay is even worse. Neither Robert Baratheon nor Cersei is happy in their marriage. Even Catelyn and Eddard Stark, what should be a loving marriage between two of the show's most noble characters, is tainted by her mistaken belief that he cheated on her, leading to the birth of Jon Snow and her lifelong resentment of him. The only truly positive, love-filled marriage that we see on screen is with Rob Stark. And, um... That didn't turn out too well either. So if government and marriage aren't working too well in Westeros, then how about religion? No again, according to Georgie Martin. Sure, the Lord of Light may be able to raise people from the dead and give birth to shadow babies, but he also requires human sacrifices in exchange for winning battles that, whoops, you end up losing anyway. Then there's the entirety of seasons five and six when Tommen yields too much power to the High Sparrow. It is one of the longest and, in my opinion, most frustrating plot lines in the series because because it feels like filler that just slogs on for way too long. But when you actually stop and look at the themes of the entire story of Game of Thrones, the purpose actually becomes clear. It's to show that no one, no institution is truly good, no matter how pious or noble the intentions might at first seem. Which is exactly why the Starks are so important in this story. Eddard Stark was a man defined by his belief of the inherent good of human institutions, and it gets him killed. His reliance on arbitrary rules and the way things are supposed to be done gets him beheaded. Sansa desires a life of finery living with the nobles in King's Landing, but when she finally gets it, she winds up being abused by Joffrey and then the Boltons. It's only when she rejects society's rules for her that she regains any sort of power in the story. Jon Snow is constantly trying to help the Night's Watch help themselves, and their response is to kill him for it. Now, in the aftermath of the Battle of Hardhome, where the tribe leaders pledge their weapons to him, he He's basically the equivalent of the king beyond the wall. He is a wildling, and is more successful now than he ever was when he was wearing the black. But perhaps the most obvious example is Arya. At the beginning of the story, Arya admires her swordmaster, Sirio Farrell, a water dancer with perfect stances and elegant moves. The Hound quickly disabuses her of this. Who taught you that shot? The greatest swordsman who ever lived. All right, you have a sword. Let's see what he taught you. Your friend's dead, Maren Trump's not. Was drawn to Dharma and a big soul. She then moves on to overturn the organization of the Faceless Men to become a merciless assassin, following her own rules and taking on any identity she chooses. And in the process, she literally has to reject her identity as a Stark. It's only when the Starks deny their name and their upbringing, their house's belief on the safety of institutions, that they're finally able to survive in this world. Looking across the series, all the systems are unjust, unfair, and destructive. Human society fails over and over again. Which leads us to theme number three, the dangers of pride. Potential threats to our beloved characters are telegraphed everywhere in this show. Catelyn actively warns Rob Stark to stay true to his marriage promise to the phrase, Walter Frey is a dangerous man to cross. I know that. You gave him your word. Treat your oaths recklessly and your people will do the same. And he doesn't and winds up dead. When Eddard threatens to expose Cersei's adultery, she turns the threat right back at him. When the king returns from his hunt, I'll tell him the truth. Wherever you go, Robert's wrath will follow you. I'm one of my wrath, Lord Stark. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win. Will you die? He's arrested and executed. The slave masters of Marine are given a pretty sweet deal by Tyrion to take seven years to phase out slavery, but they're unwilling to cooperate, and say it with me now, they get themselves killed. In all of these cases, and so many more throughout the series, pride is the reason for their downfall. Rob and Ned and the slave masters were so confident that they were untouchable that they ignored the warnings. When Jon Snow returns to Castle Black from his semester abroad with the wildlings, he gives 
gives the Night's Watch the advice to let the wildlings through. They refuse, and most die as a result. Speaking of wildlings, let's not forget Mance Raider, the king beyond the wall, their unofficial ruler, a man who refuses to bend his knee to anyone else. That pride costs him his life and the lives of many of his followers. Mance Raider was a brave man, proud man, never bent the knee. How many of his people died? for his pride. Pride gets people killed. It gets them to not cooperate. It gets them to not listen to each other. It gets them to ignore the warning signs, and by the time they realize the danger, it's too late to do anything about it. Nowhere is this better exemplified than The Last of Our Three Houses, the Targaryens. The series' time on the show was short-lived, but it was filled with misplaced pride. I am a Khaleesi of the Dothraki. The next time you raise a hand to me will be the last Last time you have hands. And the would-be Dragon King ignores the warnings and earns himself his long overdue golden crown. Danny is equally prideful though, and pays for it dearly on multiple occasions. It's actually the entire point of another of my less than favorite plot lines, Marine. In Marine, she struggles against her pride constantly as she tries to rule over Slaver's Bay. On one hand, her treatment of the masters wins her no favors. I've ordered Dario to execute every master in Young. Hurting the masters in into pens and slaughtering them by the thousands is also treating men like beasts. But there's good and evil on both sides in every war. Slavery is real. I will end those behind it. But at the same time, she loses the popular vote when she decides to publicly execute her advisor. <laughs> And of course, there's the fighting pits. Despite being advised by others to uphold this ancient tradition for the good of the people, she thinks she knows better, refuses to heed the concerns of her team, and opens the door to more animosity between her and the city. They did ask for some concessions. Concessions. Politics is the art of compromise, Your Grace. I'm not a politician. I'm a queen. It's easier to rule happy subjects than angry ones. In each case, a prideful decision from her comes with heavy negative consequences. And now, as we race towards the finish of the show, Pride is once again a huge focus around her storylines, demanding that Jon Snow kneel to her as queen before she'll lend him any favor. I will fight for you when you bend the knee. My people won't accept a southern ruler. They chose you to lead them. Isn't their survival more important than your pride? Here's why all this matters. Throughout the entirety of the series, everyone has ignored the real threat to Westeros the White Walkers. Remember how I said that pilot episodes tend to kick off all your important characters and themes? Well, in the opening minutes of the show, what are we shown? Not any of the houses, not King's Landing, heck, not even characters that live through the opening moments. No, we are shown the danger of the White Walkers as they butcher a scouting party. Even before that iconic theme music plays for the first time, it is the White Walkers that are getting top billing. Later on that same episode, we see Ned make his first crew crucial decision of the series, and by extension, his first crucial mistake of the series. He has to choose what to do with the deserter who escaped the White Walker attack with his life. Ned, being a man of rules and institutions, decides to behead him, despite the boy's warnings of the White Walker threat. No, I broke my oath. I saw what I saw. I saw the White Walkers. People need to know. Is it Trace or the White Walkers? The White Walkers have been gone for thousands of years. And from that point forward, everyone just ignores the ice zombie threat. Shortly after Eddard's beheaded, Alistair Thorne is sent to King's Landing with a zombie hand to show off, and no one cares. The Night's Watch, meanwhile, is sending out dozens of messages to all the houses asking for help, and all of the messages get ignored for months. Samuel Tarly tells the maesters in the Citadel that he has actually seen these things and that the threat is real, and they choose to just sit on their hands. Winter was coming, and coming, and still coming, and took a really long time to get there, but no one cared. No one prepared. They fought petty little battles against each other, sacrificing thousands of lives just to decide who got to sit on a really uncomfortable looking chair, and now the karmic debt is coming due. In the final hours, Cersei sees an undead white point blank, and her pride prevents her from partnering with rivals to the throne. In return, the king in the north will extend this truce. He will remain in the north where he belongs. I cannot give you what you ask. I cannot serve two queens. Then there is nothing left to discuss. The dead will come north first.
first enjoy dealing with them. We will deal with whatever is left of you. If this show has taught us anything, it's that everyone tends to die when people don't cooperate. So what kind of ending best fits with what Game of Thrones is trying to tell us? How should Game of Thrones end? Well, if we're looking at it from a purely thematic standpoint, the White Walkers should wipe out everyone. Mankind hasn't learned its lesson. We either work together to all survive, or we all end up dying. People continue to be disloyal, brutal, willfully ignorant. They rely on systems that lead to abuse. They're prideful, and that pride prevents them from working together. So who deserves to rule Westeros? No one. I mean, sure, Danny and John are working together now, but it's a little too little too late. They're all too self-interested, too short-sighted, too ethically compromised. The ending that makes the most thematic sense for Game of Thrones is for the White Walkers to win, for society to reset in some way. It's not that mankind should lose because Game of Thrones is some nihilistic universe in which choices don't matter. It's the complete opposite. It's that the choices mankind made in the lead-up to winter were wrong. They made the wrong choices. They weren't the responsible ones. And in the end, those choices should lead to their ultimate downfall. And if you don't believe that this is the ending that's deserved, remember, it's mankind's fault that the White Walkers exist in the first place. In the season 4 finale episode, The Children, Bran learns that the White Walkers were created by the children of the forest thousands of years ago. But the reason they created them was to defend against the destructive force that was invading Westeros the first men. Men landed in Westeros and immediately began slaughtering the indigenous races. In this way, the fall of Westeros is as much karma as it is anything else. There would be a karmic debt to pay for mankind's brutality, for their unjust systems to be wiped out, for their inability to cooperate leading to their demise at the hands of a unified singular White Walker force that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for them. One that the show's creators decided to show us before we met any other characters in this series. What made makes the most sense is for winter to come for all mankind. Will my prediction come true? Well, it's hard to spin off a series when everyone's dead, so probably not. But you gotta admit, that would be one really memorable way to end a series. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cuts.